What's up, folks? Welcome back to Straight Shooting alongside AJ Riley. I'm Matt Basson. AJ, it's been a little bit, man. It has been a little bit, man. You were traveling, technical difficulties last week, and boy, oh boy, we're finally back, though. And what a perfect time to be back because Miggy's got 3,000 hits and the NFL draft's starting. So we are like ripping and roaring, ready to go. Yeah, we busy. We busy. And we've got some draft stuff to get to. But before we do that, we got to talk about this little game called Baseball Age. I don't know if you've heard about it. Uh, there's been a lot of great hitters throughout the history of this game. And uh, arguably one of the top, maybe what, five to ever don a Detroit Tigers uniform just as a pure hitter. And one Miguel Cabrera has now joined the 3,000 hit mm-hmm. club the first venezuelan the seventh latino and the third tiger behind ty cobb who has over four thousand one hundred and eighty plus hits and your man al Kaline, who mm-hmm. clearly retired right afterwards because he has three thousand and seven i think mickey's gonna split the difference between them <laughs> He probably will. I mean, he's got a couple more seasons left. And just, I mean, how great for Miggy to finally get to that milestone, right? He's got another milestone coming up with the the 600 doubles as well, which is going to put him in a very exclusive club. I mean, the 3,000 hit club with only 33 Mm -hmm. members now is an exclusive club Mm -hmm. in and of itself. But when you start adding up what he's actually done with the 3,000 hits and the 300 lifetime average and the 500 home runs, you add in the 600 doubles. I mean, you're talking about a very, very exclusive group. And he's in a few of them. I mean, just the 3,500 only has seven. You know, so he's with Hank. He's with Willie Mays. He's with Albert Pujols, Rafael Palmero, A. Rod, Eddie Murray, and now Miguel Guerrero. Right. That's it. And then you got the at his batting average to that of over three hundred, and it's the great Henry Aaron, the great Willie Mays, and the great Miguel Guerrero. Mm-hmm. And then if you go, you add a triple crown <laughs> to that list, and there is one, one man, and it is the great. Miguel Cabrera. And so that leads me to wonder, because I know that the back half of, you know, this contract that he's on, right, he hasn't produced, like, we kind of figured he was going to produce, right? We we kind of figured the production would fall off. But it seems as though maybe Miggy doesn't get the recognition that maybe some of these other guys have are remembered for or maybe it's just we're too close to it right now right to recognize like how truly great miguel cabrera is as a hitter just it's phenomenal what he's been able to do with a bat in his hand i think what you say has merit for the last half of the last 10 years so the last five years, the last five years <laughs> with the Tigers becoming, well, I say this for a reason because the last five years, the Tigers have been bad, bad. just flat out bad. Mm-hmm. The first five years, so we just started 2012. Well, what did Miggy do in 2012? Man, won himself an MVP. Mm-hmm. He won himself a triple crown mm-hmm. and the Tigers were a good baseball team around him. And in 2013, I believe that's the second year of back-to-back MVPs. It is. It is. And the Tigers were in the ALCS. Now, pool, now pools, Jesus. Not pools. <laughs> Mike Trout, different angel. <laughs> Mike Trout has the one was, was the one that was fighting with Miggy through those other MVPs that Miggy grabbed. And Mike Trout continued to ascend, right. which he should. He's younger. Mm-hmm. Miggy is over the hill. Right. I'm not saying he's just physically where his peak was. He's not on his way up to it anymore. He's on his way down from it. That's where Miggy's at. It's just a fact. Age 
years wear and tear on the body it's going to happen which is why it's so great that spencer torkelson is called up this year Mm -hmm. and has taken over first base duties because miggy doesn't have to wear himself out playing first base and can just focus on hitting which he is phenomenal at and still to instill like as i mean look for his 3000th hit what did miggy do he hit opposite field classic miggy (laughs) like (laughs) there's no question the man is still one of the best of the best it was classic miggy and he, and and that's that's the thing, right? Is early into the season, you've seen this rejuvenation take place a little bit, right? And I, I don't want to get you know grandiose and say that like there's this resurgence and this renaissance of Miguel Cabrera and he's going to be back, but you can see that. I mean, he's been tagging the baseball and he's been getting hits, mm-hmm. and I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that he now doesn't feel the need to play first base because they have a capable first baseman. See, in all these years leading up to it, I feel, and this is totally conjecture, but I feel like Miggy forced himself to play first base to the detriment of himself and his hitting because there really wasn't a viable option. Yeah, there was C.J. Crone, sure, but, like, who else? Right. No. Nico Goodrum? I agree. Right. Jonathan Scope as an experiment. But now they have Torkelson. You can kind of almost sense this from Miggy. Right. Now, all I have to do is be a DH. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think the proof is in the pudding early in this season where he has he hasn't gotten off to that early season struggle that we've seen him get off to in recent years. He came out, he got those first those 13 hits that he needed in the first three weeks of the season. So I, I, I think it's huge, but and I, what I don't want us to miss in this moment, though, is how important of a moment Saturday was. Witnessing 3,000 hits, especially from somebody that wears the uniform that you root mm-hmm. for, is significant and should not, should not be taken lightly. No. Because... No, it definitely shouldn't be taken lightly. <laughs> It should not be taken lightly because it's going to be a while before we see anybody approach 3,000 hits again. I mean, the closest Mm -hmm. one's Robinson Cano with 2,631 hits. He needs 369 more hits, and he's 39 years old. Next on that list is Yadier Molina. He's got 2,100. He's not playing after this year, so he won't reach 3,000. Joey Votto's at 2,035. Maybe, Maybe he gets there. Especially with the DH being in the National League now. Maybe he gets to stick around for a few more years and collects almost a thousand more hits, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But, I mean, then you get down to, like, the Altuves, Freddie Freeman, um, even Mike Trout. Like, none of those guys, other than Altuve, have over 1,500 hits. No, Freeman and Altuve have 1,700. Trout's at 1,400. So, right. Even these well, great hitters Trout, I mean, and Trout's what? are Trout's still 30. 20, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Trout's 30 now. Freeman and Altuve are both 32. I can look really quick. Yeah. So I, I think so. I think yeah, they're both he'll 32. Be, uh, Altuve will be 32 in May and Freeman will be. He's 32 now. Turning 33 yeah. in September. So, you know, it's, it's a lot of luck of staying healthy while also being right. good at your job and getting the hits that you need. Um, you know, Universal DH, I think, will help some of these guys Helps. that are that have that chance. But mm-hmm. it's going to be a while before we ever see this again, which is and it's funny because it's a complete turnaround from what we saw a few years ago where Albert Pujols was the last of four players in four years to get 3,000 hits. So you go back to, Mm -hmm. you know, 2015, where, yeah, 2015 was A-Rod, 2016 was Ichiro, 2017 was Adrian Beltre, and 2018 was Albert Pujols. That's the last time we've seen someone get 3,000 hits. And now... But think about this, too, right? Maybe Mickey does it last year. Well, true. Yeah, it's true. And you know, I think COVID extended this. I think you know, Miggy probably gets to three thousand last year. 
you know, if the COVID year doesn't go down the way it does. But right. there, the next in line is a long way off. I mean, you go, right. you know, you look at some of the younger guys coming up. They're already throwing, you know, pay attention to Vlad Jr., pay attention to Ozzy Albies. You know, so there's the, right. those guys are a long way away. You know, about as long away they as are long way Miguel away. was when he came to Detroit in 07. Miguel, when he comes, has 842 hits 15 years ago. Man did yeah, a lot and, of hitting uh, one of the, in that time to catch up. And one of the crazy things, too, is I was listening to Dan Dickerson and Jim Price yesterday as I was doing yard work and all that, and I heard it, and it was just a fantastic call by Dan Dickerson. He's got to get a shout out there's articles all over detroit sports nation about yesterday or saturday's historic um moment but they said that miggy collected those three thousand hits off of nearly a thousand different pitchers hmm. is that crazy that's a lot of pitchers I mean, it's insane modern game that's you a know, lot of the pitchers. bullpen games and everything that's a lot of pitchers for sure and yeah. I think to your point too about the the three thousand club, right? Going four years before seeing you know the next one after all those guys got it, that also speaks to the the shift in the generations of hitters, right? Yeah. Because all of these guys, the Cabreras, the the Beltres, the Pujols, the Rodriguez, they came from a less analytical time that wasn't necessarily concerned with launch angle and was concerned with strikeouts. Right now, that's not necessarily the case. So that's going to lengthen even more the time in between Miggy's 3K and the next person in line. Because it's, the priority is not on what Miggy did for his 3,000th hit. Keeping the hands inside the baseball, going with the pitch, and shooting it to the right right side of the infield. Mm-hmm. And that, that hurts hitters big time. No, hurts I mean, hitters big time. You know. Today's baseball of it's home run or bust. It's all about the launch angle. It's all these different things right. where you're not getting as many hits. Just hits. Hits still right. count. Hits still matter. Very much so. You're looking at a class we just talked about with 33 guys in it now. Throughout all the baseball. Nothing else. Mm-hmm. No batting average, home runs, doubles, triple crown. Anything. Just 3,000 hits, which is a heck of a lot of hits. Mm-hmm. There are 33 of them in the history of baseball. The history of Major League Baseball. Right. So, and with this era I, of again, the sig- launch monitors treating it like a golf with a you know with a driver, <laughs> like this this changed right. the way guys are approaching being a batter, and I, you know oh. while it may help them in their home run chase for their careers, I think it hurts them in their batting average and hits in their careers, and so you might have guys with a whole lot of home runs who only have two thousand hits when they might have sacrificed right. fifty home runs for another you know 500 hits if they had a different process right. when it comes and, to being and a that's i'm not a professional batter so i don't know that, i'm just seeing the way the game's going <laughs> and it just seems like batters right. in the back in the day cared more about getting on base than launching it out of the park they wanted to do that but it wasn't an all or nothing now it seems like it's an all or nothing yeah but you know man chicks dig the long ball so you know you yes, might as well did. try and hit it out of the park <laughs> I don't well, know. For Mickey, I, this is amazing. For me, home you. country, this is amazing. You know, there's one Venezuelan for in, sure. in Major League Baseball Hall of Fame. You know, Ali, Luis. Right. And that's. Uh, Aparacio? Great, great uh, shortstop. Played back in the 50s, 60s, 70s. He's the only Venezuelan. And right. yeah, man had a lot of hits himself, almost 2,700 of them. But not quite the three thousand now that Miggy's mm-hmm. going to have. He doesn't have the you know the accolades that Miggy has as well with a triple crown winner, a lot of worlds, you know, a lot of all stars and all that stuff. But for the country of Venezuela to have one of their own, you know, be this this unique in the game of baseball, mm-hmm. where he's part of a club of only thirty three guys, yeah. he's part of a club of only seven guys, he's part of a club of only three guys, and he is a solo member of a club as well in the history of baseball. That's Pretty special. You know they got to be loving that down there, and we'll celebrate him whenever he goes home, whenever he gets to go home. Um, but it- and, and Dan Dickerson summed it up perfectly yesterday. He said, you know, he is the pride of Venezuela. And in a lot of ways, that is true. And that speaks to, again, going back to what I said earlier, 
it speaks to the significance of this moment on Saturday. Mm -hmm. It speaks to the significance and how important it was because it, Yes, it was great for Miggy to hit that milestone, but it was also great for not only his home country, but his family and and all of the things that just kind of tie a nice little bow onto the career that he's had. Now, that career is not over, no. and he's going to continue to hit, mm -hmm. and I think that it's important that he does continue to hit and try to lengthen his career as long as he can. And, you know, I'm excited to see him do it in our home whites. Yeah, and you know, and that's I think that's something that also was important for Miggy and from the way he talked about it with his teammates in the locker room afterwards um to I think something that we could maybe look back on why the last couple of years weren't what we were hoping out of Miggy. I think it's really important to Miguel Cabrera to do this in front of fans. He talks about, mm -hmm. you know, this hit and what it felt like and what it felt like, you know, when he joined the Tigers in 07 of, you know, 35, 40,000 fans being at Comerica all the time. And then the Tigers dri dipped and the fans went with them and we're at, you know, half sold shows and, you know, you're not getting 35, 40. And then COVID happens and then you got nobody whatsoever to go even worse from what they were. And so to have this situation where, the fans packed the stadium for him these last so many days because they all wanted to be a part of that history, uh, I think helped him a lot. He talked about how important it was for him to do this. And I think when you look mm -hmm. back at the COVID years and the down years where he wasn't doing as well because the Tigers weren't doing as well, I think the lack of having it, – it's, it's weird to think you're a professional ball player. Why should this matter? But for some guys it does. Some guys relish being the hero. It does. Some guys relish being the villain. Some guys don't care and just go about doing their business. But when you talk about the greats of the greats, and this is where Miguel Carrera, you know, lies, I think for someone of his stature, for whatever reason, this is important to have him do it in front of us. And he got to. Thank God this yes. didn't happen during the COVID years. I think that would have crushed him. <laughs> but a full stadium at Comerica. Yeah. I agree full, with you. I mean, there's. It mattered to him. That, yeah, for sure. I mean, there's no doubt, whether you like to play the hero, you like to play the villain, or you just like going about your business, there's something to be said about the energy that you gain from being in front of a home crowd. And he even said so in his press conference. It was very important for him to get 3,000 hits this homestand mm -hmm. because he wanted to do it in front of the Detroit fans. He got to 500 home runs last season in Toronto, and he goes, this was important. And I think that you could kind of tell, right, like in the series against the Yankees. I mean, he went off. He goes three for four, right, mm -hmm. in the, I think it was first or second game against the Yankees. And I'm telling you what, Matt, I, I, I told you I have a buddy that is an usher at the stadium. And he was there when Mickey was one away yeah. going into the bottom of the eighth inning, yep. right? And um, he said that, you know, Mickey had had three hits. He goes, and I have never experienced this in a ballpark before, but the pitcher got the ball, and everybody's going crazy. And he stood on the mound and was getting ready to deliver the pitch, and it was dead mm. silent. You couldn't, you could hear a pin drop. It, he goes, it was the eeriest thing, but also the coolest thing all at the same yeah. time. And then, you know... <laughs> I don't know how you feel about this, but then, you know, the next day, Miggy's over three comes up in the bottom of the eighth with a base open and Aaron Boone walks him. Right. Strategically, I get it. And I'm not even like in the moment, no, I was no, kind no. of upset at Aaron Boone. I was like, come on, man, like, don't do this. Right. But at the same time, you managed to win games and that gave his team the best opportunity to win. So. <laughs> If if you're upset, and listen, Detroit fans, you were 100% correct in booing that man out of Detroit. And you have no, there's no problem if you boo him when he comes back. He earned mm -hmm. that. But sometimes the right thing gets yeah. you booed. And he did the oh, right thing. Oh, he made thing. damn sure the Yankees are going to be no part of a historic video for years to come on the losing <laughs> side. Mickey had three chances earlier in the game, didn't yeah. get it done. This is his last at bat for the game. I'm making sure. I'm not going to be the guy that he does this off of. He had chances earlier in the game, and it didn't happen. Walk him, let him do it to somebody else, a la the Colorado Rockies. <laughs> like, 
I get it. I get you know. Yeah, but also, I mean, they were also down one nothing, mm. and you have a base open and guys in scoring yeah. position. So it's a of baseball course, move on top of it. You walk on top of being a petty move. It's a 100% baseball. Hundred percent, it was a baseball move. There was nothing. It wasn't oh, even oh, that yeah, petty. Ask Aaron Boone I mean, about it. Aaron the Boone freely of- admits it was a petty move. <laughs> he harkens <laughs> okay, back to something fine. Mickey did to him years right, ago. Got sub- him with a bat, something, and like so he he admits it. And I don't. Look. No, he said he cost him oh, a yeah, World Series. Yeah, That's what exactly. he said. So this was a petty move. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I, yeah. But and, it, and it's anyway, Aaron Boone. Aaron, it, Aaron Boone it, showed it as a still, player that he's not he's not above this. Yeah. He has no problem doing this. I appreciate that about him. I liked him as a player for that. Aaron Boone did one thing Damn in his right. career, and that was that home Damn run right. in the ALCS. And it was a historic one That's thing. That's the only thing he he has. My man has made more out of so little you than stretch anyone. You that 15 minutes as much as you can. <laughs> Maybe in the you history of baseball. You as much as you can. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> listen, milk it for all it's worth. I'm 100% with you. But, again, a hearty congratulation to Miguel Cabrera, the newest member of the 3,000 hit club. I need a cap. I need a cap and tip. put himself in – yeah, to to tip it to him, but put himself in just a insane elite company in a number number of different ways. When your name is mentioned with Henry Aaron and Willie Mays, Not, uh, in Detroit with good. Ty Cobb, that's pretty doggone good. And Al Kaline, and Al Kaline. you are you know, yeah. You know. I mean, th- those are your three best players in Tiger yep. history, right? And they deserve all the accolades that they got. Somebody the other day talked about him being the best hitter in Detroit history. I was like, ah, we're forgetting about an old Tyrus yeah. Raymond Cobb there. So we can't really go that far. But it was a completely different game. So let's, you know, Ty Cobb hit a lot of singles. Miggy hit for a lot of power. But both of them, great hitters. And I'm glad that they wore the old English D. But again, congrats, Miguel Cabrera. I have enjoyed watching you. Throughout your career here, 100%. Uh, absolutely the same. Uh, I can't really, as much as I'd love to add more to that, <laughs> I got nothing else. So we got to move on, AJ, because we are coming up this Thursday, the NFL draft. This Thursday. Uh, we with Detroit Sports Nation will be doing what we've been doing the last, I don't know, three years now of coming to, to you live on Facebook uh, during the first round of the NFL draft. Uh, we the Detroit Lions have two picks in this year's draft. Our own, the second, the one we got from the Rams, the thirty second. They also have the thirty fourth in round two. So they picking someone else picking. They picking again to start round two the next uh, the next day. We got two in round three, one in round five, one in round six, two in round seven as of right now. Looking around and saying, you know, what As what do we right need? Now. And I was I was starting to like look, like I was gonna look at like Detroit Lions. And I'm like, wait, I've been a Lions fan my whole life. I can tell you what we need. I don't need to look at anything on Sports Illustrated, ESPN, <laughs> Sports Network, whatever. I can tell you exactly what we need. We need defense. Right. We need a whole heck of a lot of defense. We don't we need do. a quarterback. We, we don't do. need a wide receiver. We need guys that are going to help the defense. We need guys that are going to help the running game because I don't want to win with this quarterback. <laughs> so I don't want a reason for this quarterback to think he could stay in Detroit. I want Jared Goff gone after this year. I want to find right. our next quarterback and start building around him. But I want to have a team ready. Trenches out. Build it in and go from there. This is all I want. 100 100- a hundred percent, and 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 that's that's the name of the game. You have to build from the trenches out. And I know I know Paul and Dylan in the big picture talked a lot about this last week. And you know Paul even brought up a really interesting thing where you try to trade Taylor Decker and and, and draft Evan Neal, and then use that mid first round pick you get for Decker to draft a guard, um, and really like establish mm-hmm. your offensive line, which. I don't necessarily disagree with, right? Because trenches matter and you have to build out the trenches. 
But what I want to focus on and, and look at is like, okay, what do mm-hmm. we do 32, 34? Because we've belabored yep. pick number two, right? Do not draft Kyle Hamilton. Do not draft Malik Willis. If Aiden Hutchinson is there, draft him. If he's not, then try to with all your might to trade out of that pick, right? Well, so I'm okay with Kayvon Thibodeau. Knowing still, that it is too. in I'm Go not ahead. I'm not hundred percent sold on we have to we have to trade out just because Hutchinson yeah, I there. Know. There's no proof that Aiden Hutchinson's gonna be a better pro than Kayvon Thibodeau. There's just not. There's speculation, there's belief about Hutchinson and what he's done versus how Thibodeau's personality has rubbed some people the wrong way. I look at what I see on the field. I still would rather have Kayvon Thibodeau than Aiden Hutchinson. And I know that's a a thing that upsets a lot of people in Michigan. Okay, so. But as a player on the field, (laughs) I still think Kayvon Thibodeau is a better football player. Sure. And yeah, he's got a personality issue. So what? A lot of greats have. Yeah, we're probably going to have to pay him and his shitty. Sorry. And his bad attitude. You can edit that right. <laughs> and his bad attitude many years later, <laughs> uh, you know, a seven year contract, whatever they give him as a rookie, you know, we're going to have to pay him, you know, when that money comes due. But I think this man's going to perform as a defense, as an edge. And I would love to see him do it in Honolulu Blue. But I'm not opposed to trading out of the second pick if we can get Maybe. a good package for it. Well, but here's the thing, Matt. Would you trade out of the second pick knowing. There have been so many people rumored going mm-hmm. to the Detroit Lions at number two that that shows me and kind of proves that there's really not a lot of value at two this year. And with all those guys being rumored at two, if you can move back a little bit, some of those guys are still going to be there. So, could you not? Mm-hmm. That's why I say trade. Even if you don't get the value according to the draft value chart that a number two pick would be worth isn't a little less value to move back and get one of those guys at a more valuable spot than reaching for them a little bit earlier and accruing a little bit more draft capital isn't that better than just taking one of those guys it definitely could be like if you could get a Thibodeau at at four or five and then also pick up maybe another second round pick or a late first round pick. Wouldn't that be better than drafting Assuming Thibodeau you can at get two? Him at five. I don't think Tav- Kayvon Thibodeau is going to be there at five. Right. There are Everything other is you draft can look dependent. Hundred you know, percent. There's Everything homeboy is from draft Georgia. Dependent. He's he's thrown his name in the hat over the last few weeks as well. Um, so if if the he's package, a combine hero, I don't want you him. know is is decent enough where we're going to accrue some good assets, you know to make with these picks then yeah i'm okay with it because again i'm not trying to win right now i'm trying to win two years from now you know i want three full seasons of dan campbell having this football team before i'm gonna have any real expectations of being a contender but going back to what you said about you know all the different possibilities of number two Go back a couple of years ago with quintricia and everybody in the everybody in the world knew who the lions were going to take at three and it did us no favors in the NFL draft. So I appreciate that Brad Holmes is playing this close to the vest and using it as leverage for possibly trading out of this position Mm. if the Jags take whoever he had his eye on at the number two pick. Yeah, and and I think that that's important. So let's move beyond two. Let's say that at two, they don't trade. And they take Hutchinson mm-hmm. or Thibodeau. So they get their edge guy, right? 32 mm-hmm. and 34 become much more interesting, in my opinion, right? So what do you do at 32? What do you do You're at 34? Me? What do I go? 32, do I go? stick with defense. I am I'm not asking falling you. for any of the wide receiver stuff, Drake London and all this yep. other stuff. I'm sticking with my defense, and I'm probably sticking in a linebacker area, you know, maybe a Quay Walker from Georgia. Uh, if uh, Maybe a Daxton Hill, maybe let, let, let the boy, you know, stay at home, you know, go from Michigan to Detroit. Uh, but, you know, if N'Kobe Dean is still there at 32, I think I'm snatching him up without even giving it a second thought over everybody else. You know, just continue to help this defense early uh, and – Having a linebacker like that roaming the field for us, I think, helps us tremendously. 
What if Nicobe Dean's still there at 26? Uh, Do you use those two picks to trade up to 26? No, because I still want to keep the assets, the drafts that we, you know, the, the spots that we do have. And there are a couple other linebackers that I am okay getting as well if Nicobe, if Nicobe Dean is gone. You trade up for him? You look like you trade up for him. Okay. I trade up for him. Oh, yeah, I trade up for him. N'Kobe Dean's been my guy since the quarterfinal or the semifinal game. Me personally, I wouldn't do it, but I'm not opposed to it. Not at two. I think it's too high for two. But with the, you know, you said we had, we have two first round, Lions have two first round picks, the second round pick, and two third round picks, right? So I'm sitting here thinking, utilize that draft capital that you got from the Stafford trade and that early second round pick to go get the impact linebacker that rarely makes mistakes on a football field and is a very, very, okay, so, very good football player. So what are you saying? So you, would trade, you would trade 32 and, then use your two th- and one of the third round picks to move up to 26? I'm not giving them 32 and 34. There's if no they way. would take that deal, I would. I'm not giving them 32 and 34 to move up to 26. No, See, because I have my I eye on someone at 34 that I really want. I would. And, you know, I think will help us a lot. And he's not being talked about at Who? all. He's absolutely just being completely ignored. And that's Trey Who? McBride. I can see by your eyes. You're like, who? Okay. This is a tight end out of Colorado State. He was Why? six foot three, 250 no, I, pounds of blocking and catching machinery. I understand we have TJ. That's all we have. We have one tight end. This is a tight end that is going to help us in multiple ways. Most importantly, the run game, because he is a great blocker, a mini Gronk in that style. And he also has great hands that will help with Jared Goff's ducks that he throws. (laughs) Everyone's talking about a wide receiver. Well, you're going to get one in Trey (laughs) McBride. But you're also going to get a guy that will tremendously help the running game. Oh, man. And if I'm going to go offense in the start of the second round. I think there's a reason nobody's talking about him at 34. That's fine. I'm going to vehemently disagree with you on that. Vehemently disagree with you on that. Like, and, and right, cordially, I guess, but vehemently. I'm not saving the 34 overall pick to draft a tight end if I can use it to get Nicobe Dean. I understand. At all. That because there's plenty of tight ends that you could go and get in, I'm in, seeing of that caliber. Well, maybe not to that caliber, but you mm, a tight end that's hang a, on, tight, end a tight end that is uh, NFL ready like it, body like wise. If if and I trust we'll get there catching wise, but I already I already would be perfectly fine throwing them in as an extension on the line to throw some blocks there for the running game. And let him and Hawk work out a fantastic dual tight end threat. I mean, it's not as bad as it's not as bad as McShay saying that the Lions should draft mm-hmm. Isaiah Spiller out of Texas A and M, the running back. <laughs> but ugh, it's up there. Personally, personally, if I cannot use those picks to get, you know, um, Nicobe Dean, right? Then at 32, I'm either drafting mm-hmm. a linebacker from Georgia, okay, Channing Tindall, okay, or I'm going with their safety. Like Dylan on the big picture last week goes, if you go Georgia, Georgia, Georgia in the first round, you're not no, really going to do was, anything. It was like going Clemson, Clemson, <laughs> like Clemson, Clemson that's not a, a couple bad years thing. ago. And I don't really see any problem with that either. Yeah. With the defensive line, a hundred percent, and I, like, but for me, the first three picks, unless mm-hmm. you use the back end two to get Nicobe Dean, the first three picks, and I don't are disagree defense, with that. Defense, defense. Unless it goes crazy, and unless it goes crazy, and you find a way to like trade a Taylor Decker to get more draft capital or whatever, you know. This is this is going to be one of the most unpredictable drafts that we've had in a long time. Nobody knows who's going number one. They mm-hmm. they think that it's going to be Aiden Hudson, but nobody really knows. Then that determines what's going to happen at number two. Then all of that 
determines what right. is going to happen afterwards, right? So if you cannot use 32 and 34 to get N'Kobe Dean, then you go and you get, in my opinion, the best available linebacker or safety, and then right. at 34, and I was- whichever you didn't do at 32. And then you've addressed all three levels of your defense to make sure that you're addressing the needs that you actually have. Our old line is good if Taylor Decker stays healthy. If they end up moving Taylor Decker, now you've created a whole nother scenario where you need to go and shore up that offensive line a little bit more, which I'm okay with. I don't touch a wide receiver if I'm the Detroit Lions until at least the third round, at minimum. Even then, I don't even know if I address it until later on. I'm definitely not addressing quarterback because the crop of quarterbacks that are coming out in 2023 are way better than anybody that comes out this year, in my opinion. When you're talking about Bryce Young, you're talking about JT Daniels, you're talking about C.J. Stroud, give me those guys. And again, we're not trying to win this year. The Lions are not trying to win this year. So we hope to, again, have a top five pick that you can use on one of those quarterbacks. So if I'm the Lions, my first three picks are defense, defense, defense. I was right with you there. I was on defense, We don't really need to address wide receiver. Right. Except for you said draft a tight end at 34. I switched up on 34 is because I found an offensive player that can help us in a multitude of ways who I think will not be there for our next pick in the third round. I'm, I'm positive. Will not be there. And so when I see a body that is NFL ready, 6'3 plus, 250 pounds, doesn't look skinny, looks filled out. The most important part of his game for a blocking tight end head coach in Dan Campbell, this guy has got down pat. He also has great hands and will eventually be a good wide receiver tight end in the NFL. But for me, most importantly, it is, like we talked about, trenches out. To me, an extension of the trenches out is the running game. You have a competent, good, going to get you 115 to 150 yards a game running game. It makes things a heck of a lot easier for whoever is going to be quarterback for the Lions two years from now. And so having a tight end like that opposite TJ Hawkinson, sure. who also does that, for sure, to me was a, it's I'm not going to get this impact of a player if I don't grab him right now because he's not going to be there in the third round for us. And we went defense, defense to start. So I was like, I can sacrifice that third defensive yeah. great player that I think we should grab as well. And I will be OK with that if that's what they end up doing. If they end up doing edge, linebacker, edge, edge, linebacker, linebacker, edge, linebacker, safety. I will not be mad for the most part, depending on who they grab. But the only reason I deviated from defense, defense, defense is that I see something in Trey McBride that I think will be very beneficial for the Lions for years to come because he can help in a multitude of ways. Yeah. And, I mean, here's the thing, and this is where we can kind of end the discussion, I would say. Nobody knows what's going to happen Thursday. It's the the entire thing is entirely up in the air and whatever happens at number two I may not like, but I definitely, definitely am not gonna be surprised by. Lions are gonna go definitely Malik not Willis at two surprised by. Kenny Pickett at thirty two. <laughs> Desmond Ritter at thirty four. <laughs> We're just gonna have a quarterback battle for the ages. <laughs> yeah. And well, have a quarterback <clears throat> competition. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that's, you're going to see insanity case, live cow. on Facebook if that's the case. But the fans out there are going to know right away what we think of these picks because we will be with oh, them yeah. live on Facebook on Thursday. Our, we're going to be kicking off, what, like five minutes before the actual draft starts or right when the draft starts, right around there. We'll be, we'll be on before the Lions make their pick, before the Jags make their pick. The goal is to kick off. Okay. The goal is to kick off at 745, in. so we can get a little bit of pre-draft coverage in before. All right, so 745 yes, we this will be Thursday. Going live at Don't miss it. Join us on Facebook. We will be on there live. We will be talking to you. Please join us. 
Throw your questions in, throw your complaints in. You got problems with what we said. We love to hear it because it makes our job a heck of a lot more fun when we have fa- fans <laughs> to bounce stuff off of. Uh, but yeah, so 745 with this us. Thursday, NFL Draft. We'll be with you through the entire yes. first round. So grab a cup of coffee or a beer or whatever it is that you plan on drinking for a few hours to hang out with us because that draft is not a short process, AJ. <laughs> It is not a short process, but it's going to be a fun process, and it will be entertaining. Yep, so don't forget, mark the calendar this Thursday, 745. He's AJ Riley. I'm Matt Bass, and we're straight shooting. Thank you for spending this time with us. We'll see you guys again real soon. Oh, 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 oh,